Welcome to the video of my talk with the title Hegel's Teleology is External Purposiveness, External Teleology as Functionalism. My name is Maximilian Scholz. I am a PhD student at the Munich School of Philosophy under the supervision of Professor Georg Sanz. In my talk, I want to deal with the questions, what kind of conceptual framework Hegel is presenting in the teleology chapter of the science of logic and from which kind of sources it was inspired. My talk is structured around, one could say, three core theses, which are shown here on, on this slide. I state that the chapter on teleology in the science of logic deals explicitly only with external purposiveness. So Hegel's theory of purposes and means is a theory of external purposiveness. I furthermore contend that the teleology chapter presents a theory of functions, namely the functional description of body parts. And I stress that the sources of the teleology chapter, so the sources of this func functionalism, are the methods of the life sciences of Hegel's time. And I will try to show that by pointing to a parallelism between the science of logic and the philosophy of nature, because in the science of logic, Hegel distinguishes between a mediated manner of realizing a purpose on the one hand, and on the other hand, an immediate realization of a purpose. And in the philosophy of nature, he distinguishes between a mediated manner of, or a mediated production of animals and an unmediated production of animals. And I want to show that Hegel, in both contexts, talks about external purposelessness. And I want to argue for the relevance of the paragraph we're going to look at in the philosophy of nature for understanding the kind of explanation Hegel had in mind when he wrote the teleology chapter. And for that, my talk has the following structure. In the first part, I will look at the teleology chapter in the science of logic and isolate this passage where Hegel suggests to illustrate the discussed theme of external purposiveness with the help of functional description of body parts. And that is exactly where he distinguishes between two ways of realizing a purpose. I will then turn to paragraph 368 of the philosophy of nature, where Hegel refers, in my opinion, to the same differentiation and where he is discussing uh, the methods of uh, the life sciences, whereby I will limit myself to the consideration of Cuvier and will leave out persons such as Treviranos, Linné and Lamarck. And I will then reflect on the externality of purposiveness in our discussed cases and consider in which way this externality for Hegel is linked to a lack of intelligibility of nature itself. And finally, I will discuss very briefly uh, some consequences of my reading, namely some other fields of application for the teleology I'm attributing to Hegel. So I'll start with the science of logic. In the science of logic, Hegel describes the relationship between the subjective purpose and the means as an immediate reference and tells us that the external object is immediately subjected to purpose. This description is also found in the encyclopedia logic. Both in paragraph 208 and the, the accompanying remark, Hegel writes that the external object is immediately conquered by the purpose. And he explains this further in the related edition. And you can read uh, the quote on this slide. The process of carrying out the purpose is the mediated manner of realizing the purpose. Just as necessary, however, is the immediate realization of it. The purpose seizes the object immediately. The living entity has a body. The soul takes control of it and has immediately objectified itself in it. The human soul has a great deal to do in making its corporal condition a means. A human being must first take possession of his body, as it were, so that it may be the instrument of his soul. Hegel distinguishes here two ways of realizing a purpose, a mediated and an immediate one. He illustrates the immediate one by the example of the soul of a living entity taking control over its body. In this example, the body is used 
as an instrument or means. The body parts are hence interpreted by their functionality or aptness for a certain purpose. For example, we could say the claws of a sloth can serve the purpose of grabbing X. It seems therefore that Hegel had in mind the functional interpretation of body parts when he wrote about a subjective purpose seizing an object immediately. Unfortunately, Hegel offers no corresponding example in order to illustrate the mediated manner of carrying out a purpose. We only are told that both ways of realizing a purpose are equally important. However, I think it, it's possible that the next step in the course of the logic presents this mediated way of realizing a purpose. Because there the means, which is directly subject to purpose, enters into an immediate relationship with other external objects. Hegel calls this process, or the process of this relationship, a mechanical or chemical one, but also states it takes place under the dominance of the purpose. I want to suggest that the mediated manner of realizing a purpose is exactly this process, the relationship of the means with an external objectivity. This suggestion is confirmed by the way Hegel afterwards writes about both kinds of relationships, the immediate and the mediated one. And again, you can read uh, the, slide, uh, the quote on the slide, that the purpose immediately refers to an object and makes it into a means as also that through this means it determines another object. So besides an immediate realization, there is also this mediated one, which is mediated through a relationship of the means to an external objectivity. If we apply this to our previous example, it would require us to describe the clause of a sloth through their relationship to an external objectivity. And that could be formulated like in the example on my slide, the claws of a sloth serve the purpose of grabbing the trunk of a tree in order to climb it. Now, obviously, in this example, I just replaced the variable x of example one with some kind of objectivity that is distinct or outside of the sloth body. It seems as if the functionality described in example one of the immediate realization of a purpose describes something like a general functionality. Claws serve the purpose of grabbing something. Whereas the functionality of example 2 relates the functionality of example 1 to a specific object to be grabbed. It makes a difference whether the object to grab is a tree trunk or an antelope. While the claws of a sloth do serve the purpose of climbing a tree, they are not apt for hunting an antelope, for example. In turn, the claws of a tiger do not only serve the latter, but also the former purpose. The functionality in the second example depends from the specific things a living entity has to do with its body parts. And this in turn is dependent on the environment of the living entity and its adaption to it. The fact that the claws of a sloth do not serve the purpose of hunting antelopes is no deficiency, as the sloth mostly lives in treetops in the tropical rainforests of South and Central America and feeds on leafy plant food. Living as a herbivore in such an environment, the claws of a living entity must have a specific functionality. So, in summary, in my reconstruction, the immediate realization of a purpose describes a general functionality of, for example, body parts. The claws of a sloth serve the purpose of grabbing X. The mediated realization, in turn, relates this general functionality to a specific external objectivity. The claws of a sloth serve the purpose of grabbing tree trunks of rainforest trees. So what both ways of realizing a purpose together describe is some kind of aptness or adaptation to environmental conditions. Now, admittedly, while my example for the immediate realization is based on an example in the addition, my example for the mediated, mediated realization may seem a little bit notional. But I believe I can show that Hegel takes up exactly those forms of functional descriptions in the philosophy of nature. Of course, I also have to admit that, strictly speaking, the logic does not discuss any content of the real philosophy. 
Nevertheless, it's clear that Hegel was inspired by the contents of real philosophy when writing the science of logic, because very often he took used models of explanations in the real philosophy or in the sciences of his time and tried to analyze which conceptual scheme of pure thought is their truth. And this is especially true for the first two chapters of the objectivity section. It is a more or less common, commonly accepted fact that Hegel had Newtonian physics in mind when he wrote the chapter on mechanism. And it's also quite an, a quite accepted fact that he had the still developing chem chemistry of Bertholet and Berzelius in mind when he wrote the chapter on chemism. Therefore, it's not unlikely that there is also a corresponding candidate of scientific explanation for teleology. And by now turning to the philosophy of nature, I will show that these are the forerunners of our today's biology, namely zoology and comparative anatomy. In the edition of paragraph 368 of the philosophy of nature, Hegel takes up the distinction from the science of logic we have analyzed. The paragraph has the title Die Gattungen und die Arten and discusses the methods of classification of animals applied in zoology and its auxiliary science, comparative anatomy. According to Hegel, animals are distinguished into different orders of animals by means of their forms, which is their habitus or external appearance. And regarding these forms, he distinguishes two ways of production. And you can read uh, the quote on the slide. It is then the graded scale of formation which provides the basis for the main divisions in the general classification of animals. In its inner formation, the animal is an unmediated self-production, but in its outwardly orientated articulation, it is a production mediated by its inorganic nature. I want to suggest that this unmediated and mediated productions of animals are the same as the immediate and mediated realization of a purpose. A little bit later in the text, Hegel tells us that uh, the unmediated production concerns the organism's viscera, while the mediated production concerns the outwardly orientated articulation. Hegel describes here a procedure through which animals are classified, that means assigned to different classes, genesis, species, and so on. And that is done by looking at the form of their inner organs and their limbs. Particularly, the form of the outwardly orientated limbs is mediated, that means influenced, by its relation to the inorganic nature. I find it pretty difficult not to see a parallel between what is said here and what is said in the science of logic. And I think it gets even clearer when we consider that the, as the aspect of the formation which is used for classification is in fact the functionality or aptness of this form. In the case of inner organs, it is for example the aptness for the, ent for the entrails for the digestion of a specific kind of food, while in the case of the limbs, it is the aptness for a life in a respective environment. This can be pointed out by looking at the way in which Hegel refers to Cuvier, the, how he calls him, illustrious founder of comparative anatomy. According to Hegel, Cuvier's method made it possible to see the significance of the interrelated organs and functions. Likewise, Hegel states, it was an important aspect of Cuvier's approach to take into consideration the way in which nature shapes and adapts this organism to the particular element in which it places it, to climate, to a range of nutrition, and in general, to the environment which it finds about it. So Cuvier's method is characterized by looking for the functions of the, animal, of the body parts of animals, and in particular, in which way these parts are related to the animal's environment. Now, in the addition of paragraph 368, we can find several citations of Cuvier, amongst others, where we can see this method in application. And I'm sorry for the long quote, but I wanted to display it in full length because I find it very instructive. Consequently, if the intestines of an animal are so organized 
that they are only able to digest raw meat. Its jawbones must also be adapted to the swallowing of its prey, its claws to the seizure and tearing of it, and its teeth to the biting off and chewing of the flesh. What is more, the animal's whole system of motor organs must enable it to pursue and overtake other animals, just as its eyes must enable it to see them at a distance. It is even necessary that nature should have implanted in the animal's brain the instinct by which it conceals itself and lays traps for its victims. These are the universal requisites of carnivorous animals, every one of which has to combine all of them within itself. Particular conditions such as the size, the species and the haunt of prey also result from particular circumstances within the general forms, however, so that not only the class, but also the order, the genus and even the species is expressed in the form of each part. I think the application of functional descriptions of animal body parts in this case is pretty obvious. A carnivore has to have certain traits, like sharp claws, in order to be able to seize prey. What is interesting is that Cuvier distinguishes between, on the one side, universal requisites of carnivorous animals, and on the other side, particular conditions. The former describe general conditions to which every carnivore has to accord. In order to be able to eat meat, the animal's intestines have to be apt for the purpose of digesting meat. Its claws have to be apt for the purpose of seizing prey, and so on. An animal is exhibiting such functional traits can thence be identified, that means classified, as an instance or realization of the universal carnivorous animal. But in addition, there are particular conditions, namely environmental circumstances, in which a certain animal is found, and which in turn influence the general form. The form of limbs, like claws, is considered to be dependent on the environment of the animal. It makes a difference if an animal has to chase down mice or antelopes. The same counts for herbivores. A giraffe, for example, has multiple stomachs in order to be able to digest plant fibers. But as it lives in an environment where its nourishment grows on high trees, it needs to have apt limbs in order to reach it. For example, a long neck. Hegel explicitly associates with these kind of explanation, uh, functional descriptions the notion of purposiveness. He, Cuvier, had to study their formation and through this he was led to consider the purposiveness of the way in which the individual limbs are related to one another. Admittedly, it is not clear from this passage if Hegel uses purposiveness in the sense of inner or of external purposiveness. But I maintain that it is external purposiveness. For Hegel relates this purposiveness with the two ways of production of an animal, which has great similarity with the two ways of realizing a purpose of the science of logic, which is part of a treatise on external purposiveness. Furthermore, the talk of universal requisites and particular conditions resembles very much the general functionality and its relation to an external objectivity we found in the science of logic. So, in summary, in this part of my talk, I tried to highlight this parallelism of the functional descriptions that were applied in comparative anatomy with the functional descriptions in the science of logic. Now, when we take a closer look on Hegel's evaluation of the methodology of Cuvier, it seems even more likely that the purposiveness at stake here is external purposiveness. Because Hegel explicitly emphasizes the advances that zoology has made and stresses the important role that Cuvier and his comparative anatomy have played. Thus, zoology has stopped producing artificial systems and has finally moved on to consider the objective nature of the forms of animals themselves. But besides his praisal of the achievements, Hegel constantly renders the applied methodology problematic. This is because for the classification, so zoologists search for a common element of a species to which they can reduce the concrete forms they discover in nature. 
And as an example, Hegel mentions fins, which are apt for the purpose of moving in water and can be used to identify an animal as an instance of the general concept fish. Since the common element is searched in the form of a sensus determinateness, it is essentially, and I quote, an external one. End of quote. But a universal, such as a fish, in Hegel's mind, is not bound in any particular mode to its external existence. In general, universals do not just exist in nature, and it is always problematic to perform classification via such concrete traits. Because, as we can all imagine, fins may, could be used to identify dolphins, which are mammals, and at the same time, sharks, which in turn are fish. But Hegel also admits that if there cannot be found any such common element in the form of a sensor's determinateness, that, quote, classification will be difficult, end of quote. Hegel therefore sums up the method as follows. In this classification, the features and habits of the individual genera and species are used as the basis and rule, but the untrammeled variety of life in this genera and species excludes all universality. Consequently, the infinity of forms exhibited by animal being is not to be pedantically regarded as conforming absolutely to the necessary principle of orders. The general determinations must be made to rule, therefore, and the nat natural forms compared with them. If the natural forms do not tally with this rule, but exhibit certain correspondences agreeing with it in one respect, but not in another, then it is not the rule, the determinateness of the genus or class, etc., which has to be altered. The rule does not have to conform to these existences. They ought to conform to the determinateness, and this actuality exhibits deficiency insofar as it fails to conform. The rules zoologists and anatomists formulate remain external to the actual forms of animals. Still, Hegel emphasizes that the, scientists, that the scientist does not have to abandon this rule, but instead should keep on using it. Not the rule has to conform to the concrete existences, but the determinateness found in nature has to conform to the rule. It seems as if Hegel in this case accepts a kind of useful rule-guidedness for the classification of nature. This rule can be external to the actual form in nature, but it nonetheless can be used to classify animals. In contrast to Kant, Hegel does not attribute this externality to the deficiency of the human intellectual capacities. Rather, it is nature itself which is deficient. If one is prepared to admit that the works of man are sometimes defective, it, is most, it must follow that those of nature are more frequently so, for nature in the idea is the idea in the mode of externality. In comparison, spirit is the only sphere where clear distinctions are possible. Only thought or the understanding can establish fixed differences, and only spirit, because it is spirit, can produce works conforming strictly to these differences. This is not the case with nature, however, for an animal form can progress in two ways. The main differences must be recognized despite these imperfect productions of nature. The transitions have to be interpolated as mixtures of the, of the differences. The formation of, the individuals of, of individuals in nature is subject to external accidents. This is the reason why nature, and in particular the animal world, can never be regarded as a rational system of organization. The forms of animals are in themselves exposed to contingency and they can never fully accord to any rule or principle. That is, even if they have to be regarded as purposive systems, their purposiveness will essentially be an external one. Hegel describes the method of zoologists as the application of functional explanations and explanations of adaption. Via these functional traits, animals are classified and nature thereby described as a system. However, since nature, and in particular the animal world, is interspersed with contingency and is explicitly called 
the sphere of externality, also those functional traits, are external and contingent ones. The animal world lacks to a certain degree intelligibility and that is its deficiency. So, in my talk, I try to argue that the teleology of the science of logic presents a theory of external purposiveness, which can be read, according to Hegel's own examples, as a theory of the functional interpretation of body parts. And by, I try to do this by pointing to this parallelism between the science of logic and uh, the philosophy of nature. And um, I tried to show that the sources of inspiration for this kind of functionalism were the methodologies of the life sciences of Hegel's time. Now, before I finish now my, uh, with my talk, I will very briefly discuss some potential other fields of application of Hegel's teleology. Because, all in all, my aim is to understand Hegel's theory of external purposiveness that is the chapter on teleology as a distinct and independent part of the section on objectivity and not only as a transitional piece or critique of the deficiency of external purposes. And now, the interesting task for me to take is to find other fields where Hegel's teleology, which means the presented kind of functionalism there, can be applied to. Because just like the conceptual scheme of mechanism, applies to solar system to the solar system as well as the process of for example learning a poem by heart and the conceptual scheme of chemism applies to the relation of acid and base as well as military conflicts and love relationships there should be other examples to which hegel's teleology can be applied to and one example for the moment for me um, could be the um, uh, could be intentional actions as maybe a specific case of the functionality of body parts. And I would like to argue that the immediate use of the body as an instrument can be interpreted in analogy to what is called basic actions in contemporary debates on the theory of action. For example, opening a door by performing the unmediated movement of my arm, which means the basic action of moving my arm, and thereby causing the mediated movements of the door handle, the door lock, and so on. Another possible field of examples could be roles that things, things have as components of a system. For example, social roles. A king has the function of immediately representing the state. He fulfills this rule, that means he rules the state, by establishing laws. And the laws could be something like the external objectivity he's relating himself to, or maybe other roles like the servant or some ministers. Or think of, uh, of a game of chess. Uh, the king in the game of chess has the function of being the most important chess piece. It fulfills this role by its relation to the movement pattern on the checkerboard of the other chess pieces. And again, the movement pattern of the checkerboard, on the checkerboard of the other pieces could be the external objectivity that the, 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 piece, the chess piece of the king is related to. And another possible field of application that I can imagine might be capitalism. My buying decision has the immediate function to satisfy my individual desire, but thereby I general, uh, generate general prosperity. These are just some general thoughts um, I'm having for the moment. I'm, I would be very happy to discuss them uh, with you. And for all who are interested in further reading on Hegel's relationship to the methodologies of the life sciences, I take the liberty to refer to my article, which I was lucky to publish in the Hegel Bulletin. In this article, I try to show in which way Hegel took up functional descriptions that were used in the life sciences of his time and in which way he considered them to be the application of external teleologi teleolog teleological explanations. By that, I tried to highlight a line of thought in Hegel's work which presents what I called a productive and not only a destructive theory of external purposiveness. I have written my email address on this slide in case anyone wants to contact me or send me their questions, maybe on my paper or on my uh, talk.
So thank you very much for watching. I'm looking forward to discussing with you your questions, your critique, and also I would be very happy to discuss together other applications of the kind of functionalism I attributed to Hegel's teleology. Thank you.